Hi everyone, welcome to Python Tutorials with a special focus on image processing. I hope all of you watched the last couple of tutorials in this playlist. In the last one, we did go through the process of setting up Google Colab so we can accelerate our deep learning training. So I highly recommend you watching that video and getting your Google Colab ready for what we are going to do today. And the one before that, two videos ago, we talked about deep learning in general. So if you do not have any background in deep learning, or if you would like to really get a refresher in terms of what deep learning is, I recommend you to watch that video. We are going to use Google Colab for today's exercise, so I seriously hope you have it. If not, if you're comfortable with uh, any other IDE like uh, Spider in Anaconda or PyCharm, that's okay. If you have your uh, GPU set up at home, that's also fine You know, on your home computer, I mean, uh, or any system that you have access to. Now, without GPU, the training will be a bit slow in general, but today we are not going to work with image data sets. We are going to work with a uh, structured data in the form of CSV. So for this video, you can get away by not leveraging GPU to speed up your training process. Okay, so please follow this. I'd like to go through every step in a methodical way, assuming that you know nothing about deep learning. So this video can be very useful in introducing or getting introduced to some of the terminology that we use in machine learning in deep learning. But first, let's understand the problem itself. So what are we trying to do, right? Anytime you're thinking about deep learning, uh, of course, it's good to learn about technology, but try to think about what problem are you trying to solve and does that problem require deep learning, right? So first of all, understanding the problem is important. So let's actually uh, do some breast cancer diagnosis. And here is some information about the problem statement and the data set. And then we'll jump on to Colab in a minute. So the problem is diagnose whether the patient has breast cancer using the features, or sometimes we call those as attributes, okay? Uh, using those that are actually provided. Now, what data is available? You can download the data from this link. I'll leave the link down in the description but uh, the features and corresponding labels are provided as a CSV file, okay? So you have a bunch of features. If you followed my machine learning, you know, for image segmentation, for example, we took images and we extracted features and we compiled features into single columns. And then we did random forest, right? In this case, the features are already given to us, so we don't have to extract features, right? With most st structured data, you have some sort of features at uh, associated with your data. We'll have a quick look at that in a minute. So even if it doesn't make sense right now, hopefully it will in a minute. And these features are computed from a digitized image. So what they did is took a fine needle aspirate and then look at uh, the breast mass and then they computed a whole bunch of uh, 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 parameters. We'll look at uh, what these parameters are in a minute. These are all provided as part of this CSV file. So this is a two class problem. Either this breast mass, like by looking at that image and attributes, is this a benign or is this malignant? That's it. So this is a binary problem, okay? So this is what uh, we need to do. And our strategy is we are going to use deep learning, not so deep, but deep learning, to train a model using the features as input, okay? Think of X as input, Y as output, okay? The common convention, right? Our X would be all the features that are provided and our Y would be output, which is, is it benign or malignant? This is a binary case. So we'll have an output that tells us, is this either a benign or malignant? That's it. And then we are going to train it using our training data. So we have this entire data set. We will divide this into training and testing. The training model will never see the testing data, okay? That's how it should be. You train it on the training data and then you take the model and evaluate this on the testing data. Okay, so that's the strategy here. Now, if you are curious about the attribute information, I believe there are 30 of these and you can see uh, there is a mean radius, mean texture, mean perimeter area and so on. So there are a lot of uh, uh, attributes that are provided that are measured and we have a total of 569 data points not, not a lot, 569 data points. And uh, as you can see, for example, radius, the value is 14. And the value for area 
is 654, okay, 654. The value for concavity is 0 0.08. The point I'm trying to make here is the attributes are ranging from 0 0.08, and uh, I think there are even smaller numbers here, like 10 to the negative three, right, 0 0.007, all the way to uh, 100 or 200 or 1000 in some cases. In some cases, we, uh, probably 100 or 800 is probably the maximum here. So there is at least four to five orders of difference. Again, why am I talking about this? When you fit a model, usually most models are biased towards larger numbers. So we have to find a way to bring all numbers into certain range. So one technique that we typically use is scaling. Hey, how about taking the minimum and maximum of each data right, of each data set within it. Like for example, for radius mean, what is the minimum and maximum, okay? And then process our data such a way that we go from zero to one. The minimum would be zero, maximum would be one. Everything else fills in between. So this is called scaling. We'll talk about this again in one of the upcoming, uh, uh, upcoming lectures. But for now, I just wanna give you quick introduction to this terminology, okay? So right away, you can see the need for scaling. That's the point here. Also, is our data balanced? We spent uh, entire tutorial on balancing our data set. This is relatively okay. I mean, we can focus a bit on balancing the data set, but maybe we can get away by not balancing it. You see, we have a little over 200 malignant and uh, about 350 benign of all 569 data points. So this gives us a nice understanding of data. This is very important before we jump into trying to solve the problem, okay? And finally, what are we going to do? Remember, I showed you a neural network something like this, but with many hidden layers in my lecture about uh, what is deep learning. But this is deep learning because we have one hidden unit. So the, the model that we are going to fit is, we'll have input. How many features in input? 30 features, right? Why 30? Because we have 30 of these features. So 30 features go in, and then we have a hidden unit, and let's actually put 16 units of hidden, okay, right here, and then our output will be a single output. Now let's look at this. From the, between the input and the dense layer, let's actually drop randomly 20% of connections. You see, for example, from this one, I only have one connection. I dropped a few of the other ones. And from here, there is no connection to this one. I'm randomly dropping 20% of the connections. Again, I'll explain what dropout is and why we need to do that in one of the upcoming tutorials. But for now, think of this as something that helps uh, generalizing the model, not overfitting it for this specific data. Okay, it just generalizes it for, so it works very well for any upcoming uh, data in future, okay? So that's uh, one of the tricks that we do. So what are we going to do? Define th uh, our input, define our hidden layer, and define our output layer with only one output. Why is it one output? We have benign and malignant. We have two things that we need to predict. Why not two outputs? Well, one is more than enough. Right? I mean, one is actually enough uh, to predict if it is benign or malignant. If the value of that one output is zero, let's say it's benign. If the output is one, it's malignant, right? So you have one output with a specific number, then uh, then then you're fine. For multi-class, you need many, many outputs. But for binary, you just need one output. I hope that makes sense. And here is how we are going to add the model. My model, I'm going to use sequential method. Add a dense layer with 16 right? And uh, with an input dimension of 30, that means 30 are coming in and then going into these 16 of these. And then we are dropping out 20%, 0 0.2. And then we are going to add a dense layer with only one unit right there. And we are going to add a sigmoid activation. Remember, again, uh, two lectures ago, we talked about activation. The output from here is multiplied by the activation, and then it gives us a probability or a classification, depending upon what, what, what uh, uh, activation function we are using. Here, we are using ReLU activation function. I'll dedicate one tutorial just talking about activation, okay? For now, just look at this. Once we add this, we need to compile all of these uh, and that's what the next step is. We are compiling it using what loss? Binary cross entropy. Again, I talked about briefly loss function a couple of lectures ago. For example, linear regression, mean squared error is a loss function. Because whenever we are modifying our model, we are looking at, okay, am I moving in the right direction? 
is the error between the predicted value and the actual value decreasing as I'm improving the model, right? So that's what the loss function is. Loss function is a metric that we are looking at every time we fit the model. Optimizer, in this case, I'm using something called Adam, but again, uh, this is very similar to gradient descent I talked about three, four lectures ago. Again, we'll talk about that uh, in the, one of the upcoming tutorials, but uh, optimizer is, uh, is the one that's actually uh, looking at this loss function and then, okay, let's move in the right direction or this is the wrong direction and so on. So optimizer definitely helps us do that. And whenever we do this, what metrics are we looking at? Accuracy. Okay, and you can track multiple uh, metrics. So if you understand this line by line, this is very easy. But the goal for this tutorial is to get your feet wet when it comes to deep learning by getting the data ready and uh, getting this small you know, mo uh, model uh, done and then fitting this model and looking at your results. This gives you tremendous satisfaction, believe me. After this, you get enough confidence to get to the next level, which is understanding each one of these uh, at a at a you know slightly deeper level. Okay, so with this information, let's go ahead and uh, jump onto our collab. And I hope all of you did set up the collab. If not, this is the time. Okay, pause the video. This is the time. Set up your collab because we are going to jump onto Google in a second. Okay, so here is my browser again with a brand new Google. Uh, account where we did uh, start one notebook in the last tutorial. So hopefully we should just see one notebook here. So first thing first, let's go to our drive.google.com. So here we should just see, you see how we have collab notebooks folder. Here is where all your collab notebooks are going to be stored. So if I go in there, we should only see one notebook because this is the only one we created in the last tutorial. And this is called exploring collab uh, underscore, you know, dot IPI notebook. Now let me go ahead and uh, create a new folder. I'm gonna call this data. So I'll put all my data, all my images and everything for all my notebooks into this uh, folder. So uh, this is the easiest way to access these, uh, for example, the CSV file we are going to uh, use for today. Okay, so here, let me move my CSV file and you can download that. I, I provided the link down below. You can download that file. Just Google search for Wisconsin breast cancer data set. It's very easy to find uh, or you can just go ahead and follow the link I uh, provided. So I already downloaded that. So Wisconsin breast cancer data set. So let's go ahead and copy this to our collab. Again, I'm doing all of these in real time. So any issues, we'll figure it out together. Okay, I don't want to show something that works smoothly and then you go and do it. All of a sudden you feel like, okay, nothing is working for you. And I have been through that route. That's exactly why I'm doing this. So let's open this uh, CSV file to see exactly what it contains. I'm just double clicking using our Google Sheets here. So there you go. So the first column is ID. I guess the ID of the patient. The second column is diagnosis, either it is uh, malignant or benign, right? So there are some Bs, there are some Ms, as you can see. And the next columns are radius mean, texture mean, perimeter mean, and I think you got the idea. We have 30 of these attributes. And then in addition to that, we have ID and diagnosis. So now we have a good understanding of, okay, how our data looks like. So let's go back and let me create another tab where we can just go to collab.research.google.com. Now here, we should see two things. One is welcome to collab. This is by default, it's there. And the other one is exploring collab. And I literally opened this four hours ago, so it kind of gives you a nice, uh, info, you know, uh, good history of what you have opened recently. Okay, now let's create a new notebook from scratch. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to write every line and make this video longer than it needs to be. I have already written this, uh, you know, on a notepad on a different screen. So I'll copy one chunk at a time and let's explore uh, what that chunk is doing here. OK, so first of all, the first thing that we need to do is give this an appropriate name. So let's say uh, binary classification breast cancer. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a decent name that tells us exactly what it does. So let's go ahead and uh, save. Now, this is a new notebook. 
So first thing first, we have to decide our runtime. I know I would like to use GPU, so let's go here and change runtime type, and I'm going to select GPU. Otherwise, it's going to be only CPU, okay? So let's do GPU, save, and the next step is I would like to connect. So let's go to the top right and click to connect. And let me go to view, and is there a way to zoom in? Okay, that's fine. Let me just zoom in by using Control plus, so it's a bit easy for you to see. Okay, now it's connected. Now my GPU is ready. I have, I have everything I need. One other thing, where is our input file? Our input file is in Google Drive, right there. How do I import this Google Drive? So in order to get access to the, you know, your, your folder in Google Drive, let's click on this files and select mount drive here. So when you click on that, it says, okay, permit this notebook to access your Google Drive files. Yes, I want to do that. And let's go ahead and connect it. And let's go ahead and sign up just security wise. It's very important to do that. Now, there you go. Now it has mounted that drive onto this virtual machine because my Google Drive may be somewhere. My notebook is somewhere else in the cloud. I need to connect those two. That's exactly what we have done. So now you see drive right there and now I can open this and under my drive I should see Colab Notebooks. Under Colab Notebooks I should see my data and this is the Wisconsin Breast Cancer data that, that we just uh, uploaded to our Google Drive. Now if I click on these three dots I can copy the path and there you go. We are all set. It's that easy. Okay, now let's start uh, coding. In fact, I like I mentioned I have already copied uh, I mean, I created my code onto a notebook plus plus on a different screen, but let's go ahead and copy and paste. So this is just, uh, since I plan on sharing this notebook with you all, I wanted to make sure all my comments and everything uh, are intact. So this is just my comments. Again, you can add this as a text, but I like to work as a code. So I'm uh, adding this as comment. So the comment is basically how to download your data set and what different attributes actually mean and what type of numbers do you have as part of your uh, attributes. Okay, now that's done. Let's go ahead and click the code button down here so we can add a code cell. Okay, in this cell, I'd like to first start off with the libraries that we are familiar with that we know we'll be using with. And oftentimes I do plotting, I do NumPy, and I also do pandas. These are the three things that I usually imp import right away. So now that we have this, let's go ahead and run this. Okay, I'm running the each cell right now. You can run the entire code. You can just go to runtime, run all is shortcut is control F9 and uh, run the focus cell is control enter and you can select a specific line and you can actually do i think it's control shift enter yeah right there run selection control shift enter okay now let's go ahead and add another uh, line down here now let's import our csv file right so what we need to do is let's just uh, uh, write down read csv and we need to give our path right here Okay, you know how to get our path, right? I mean, this is our path. Go ahead and copy the path and paste it right here. Now, if I run this, hopefully we should get no errors. Everything is fine. This tells us, okay, now we have loaded our CSV file. Let's go ahead and print. Uh, let's do one thing. Let's go ahead and print uh, uh, df.describe, right? So df. Now, I would like to convert this into... Um, let's actually transpose this so it's easier for us to read. So let's describe this. So once we run it, there you go. This is exactly what I copied and showed you earlier in the presentation. So I have all of these 31 rows and eight columns. Okay, eight columns for uh, uh, in, in uh, once we transpose this, but you can see we have radius, we have texture, perimeter. So overall, we have 31 of these. And one of these is useless. Like ID is obviously useless for us uh, well, when it comes to fitting the model. Okay, so this gives you a nice understanding of, okay, what we have. And it also tells us, oh, the data is loaded uh, fine. Now, I like to 
explore the data if that's the first time I'm actually looking at uh, this data, right? You have to plot, uh, perform various plots and all that. Let's not waste time in doing that because we kind of got a good understanding from the description of the data set itself. But one thing I would like to know is, is there any null data? Oftentimes when you deal with uh, structured data like this, like CSV files or something, you may have some uh, cells where you have missing data. If so, that doesn't work very well when you're trying to fit a model. Either drop it or fill it with something that makes sense. So first of all, let's go ahead and check if there is any uh, missing data. This is These are the common steps uh, when you work with structured data, okay? So this would be, uh, let's go ahead and did I, yeah. Let's go ahead and copy these two lines and paste it here. So print DF is null, okay, and sum. It tells you, okay, how many null uh, rows do we have? So let's go ahead and print that. And right now it says there is nothing, which means we have very excellent data. There's nothing that's uh, null. If there is something in your data, go ahead and add this line, right? Drop NA. Uh, if it's only a few of these rows. So that's why I included that over there. And now what do we do after this? Okay, let's go ahead. And uh, for one of the things I do not like is the label for us is called diagnosis, right? Either benign or malignant. I like to rename that as label because it's easy for me to think in terms of labels. So that's the next step I'm going to uh, perform right now. Rename our data set label. So let's go ahead and add that here. Again, hopefully you can see how methodically we are uh, cleaning up our data. So I just changed my nothing. Uh, I, I changed nothing other than the other than the label or the title of this from diagnosis to label. So it's a bit easy for us to understand. But if you look at the object types, everything is a number except for my label. My label is an object. In other words, my label is a text. It's either B or M. Everything else is a number which means I can easily work with others, but I need to do something with my label. But before changing anything, let's actually see how the distribution looks like, yeah? So let's go ahead and plot it. I'm plotting the count plot using Seaborn library here, okay? And we are only looking at the data coming from the column label. So let's go ahead and plot this and Again, we saw this earlier as part of the presentation. So we have about 200 plus uh, malignant and 350 plus benign. This is the time, if you would like to balance this, again, follow one of the uh, processes I talked about as part of uh, my uh, tutorial on handling imbalanced data, okay? So you can try to balance this by either upsampling malignant or downsampling benign or a combination of these two, okay? Um, now let's actually get down to uh, replacing these labels because uh, we just saw that these these are the labels are objects, right? These are benign and malignant. But in order for us to work with these, we have to convert them into zero, one, two, threes, and so on. Since this is a binary problem, uh, our values would be zero and one. If you have like 10 different classes, our, uh, our values, uh, uh, again, I'm, I got distracted by this message. You're connected to a GPU runtime, but not utilizing GPU change to a standard runtime. It's saying, okay, you are not doing anything with GPU. These warning messages will actually pop up. Again, this is one of the things with uh, free being free, right? I mean, you have to put up with these. Okay, let's get back to our track right now. So uh, let's replace our B and M with zero and one. If it's a multi-class problem, you have 10 different things, then it would be zero, one, two, three, Four, right? I mean, we dealt with classes uh, in uh, Random Forest and uh, we, we dealt with this in the past, but it's worth re uh, repeating. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and use our label encoder. Um, so let me create a new block of code right here and let's uh, go through this one by one. Okay, so distribution of data. First of all, let's, uh, uh, let me highlight this and go to my runtime and run only the selection. This is a good way of actually looking at uh, each line, even though they are in the same cell. We already know we have 357 benign and 212 uh, malignant, right? So what is the next step? Now let's actually look at uh, look at the labels B and M. In fact, uh, let's go ahead and uh, define the dependent variable that needs to be predicted. Meaning, so far we are dealing with uh, data frame, data frame of labels. Now let's start defining these as X and Y. X is all the attributes, Y is what we want to predict. Okay, so our Y is what? Y is basically our label column 
in the data frame, but extract only the values, which means we are converting that into a NumPy array. So let's go ahead and run this uh, selection and let's go ahead and print the unique values in our Y, okay? Which would be B and M. I mean, I, why am I doing this? Because uh, again, when you're working in notebooks, uh, one thing you'll realize is you have to add as many print statements as possible because you want to get a good understanding of your data as you're working with it. Okay, let's go ahead and run the selection. So we have B and M, right? These are the two values that we have in our data set called Y, which is a NumPy array right now. Okay, now we need to encode this B and M into 0 and 1. How do we do that? Again, uh, we have done this a couple of times in the past as part of our machine learning, uh, regular machine learning videos, but it's worth repeating again. As part of scikit-learn pre-processing, we have a label encoder method and we instantiate label encoder and we are going to fit transform our Y values. By default, it's going to change these B and M or whatever you have into 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so let's do that. And also at the end of this, let's go ahead and print the unique values and let's hope we'll see zero and one. So run time, run selection. So at the end of this, our labels after encoding are zero and one. So now we are ready with Y. We need to get our X ready now. Okay, again, step by step. So what is our X? So let's go ahead and uh, get our X ready. So let me copy those lines there and let's paste that here. Now the step we are trying to do is, of course, we have to define our X and normalize or scale, yeah, the values. Why do we need to normalize or scale? We saw the range earlier. Some values are in hundreds, some are in tens, some are in uh, one tenth and some are in one hundredth. So there's a big range. We need to bring everything into similar range. And there are many tricks to do this. Again, I'll devote one of my upcoming tutorials on the scaling topic. But for now, let's uh, use one of the uh, common ones, okay? So first of all, let's define our X. What is our Y? Our Y is our data frame with column label labeled right? This is our Y. We have only one column with our Y because we are only predicting one thing here. Our X has many attributes, not just one attribute. This is not just a linear between X and Y. One variable, uh, this is multivariable. You have many variables that are contributing towards uh, predicting our Y, okay? So our X is basically our entire data frame, our entire data frame, except for the columns labeled label and ID because they don't have anything to do with uh, uh, predicting or uh, uh, you know benign or malignant. So this is what, and then let's go ahead and describe this. So let's run this entire cell. Now you can see that this is our, uh, our X right now. Everything except for label and ID. This is it. And we have 30 rows, eight columns. That means we have 30 features. Go, uh, we are defining as X. Okay, so I hope you understand. Now, look at the mean values. You have 654 here, 19, 91, 0 0.06, 0 0.003. I think we talked about this quite a bit, the need for scaling in this case. Let's bring everything to the same range. So uh, there are many ways. Again, you can just uh, use, in this case, I'm going to use min max scalar. As the name suggests, it's looking at the minimum and maximum and scaling everything, uh, uh, you know, between uh, a certain certain range, all of these by looking at the minimum and maximum. So if I just go ahead and run these, so this is part of scikit-learn pre-processing. You just instantiate your scalar and then you fit it to your X values. And uh, now, uh, you know, you transform your X values and now I'm printing the X values. Now you can actually see the values are all between zero and one. They go from zero is the minimum, one is the maximum, and everything is going between zero and one. Okay, so that's what the scalar does. And again, this is one single line. If you go through these in a methodical way, as you can see, this is, uh, this is uh, pretty straightforward. So now we have our X and Y ready. We are ready to fit our model, finally. Well, not yet. Remember, we talked about training data set and testing data set. Where do we get our testing data set? We only have one data set here, which means we have to split our data into training and testing. We have done this again as part of our regular 
uh, machine learning, uh, traditional machine learning courses in the past, uh, or lectures, I should say, in the past. So let's go ahead and split our data. Again, for that, we are going to use the same one from scikit-learn, model selection, train test split, and we are going to split our X and Y with 25% test size, 75% uh, training. I like this split, typically. It works fine. Uh, so let's go ahead and leave that as is. So let's go ahead and print what the sh uh, training shape is and testing shape is after we split it. Remember, we have a total of 569 data points, I believe. So now the, our shape of training data is 426 by 30, right? 426 rows and 30 columns representing 30 features. If you print the shape for Y, it would be again 426 by one because we only have one column. Similarly, our testing is 143 by 30. Okay, uh, I believe some of you are thinking, why is this guy going very slow? There is a reason why I'm going very slow because bulk of the viewers here probably are seeing these type of things for the first time. So I really wanna make sure you either uh, learn the new stuff that I'm talking about or uh, uh, you know, use this as a refresher, okay? Uh, now we are all set. From now on, it's deep learning. Okay, what library are we going to use? Remember, we haven't installed anything here because as we saw in the last tutorial, TensorFlow and Keras are already installed here on Google Colab. So we just need to import those libraries. So let's go ahead and import uh, Keras. Keras makes deep learning easy, I would say. So uh, instead of importing entire Keras, let's uh, uh, import sequential method from keras.models. Again, uh, as you use these uh, uh, more and more, it comes as second nature. And keras.layers, layers is like different layers that you can add. Keras.layers, let's import the dense layer, activation, and dropout. If you're dealing with images, you'll uh, this is where you would import convolution, 2D convolution, and any other operations like max pooling and other operations. But for now, because we are working with very simple example, just these should do. So let's go ahead and import and it should be relatively quick. And now comes the fun part. So let's go ahead and uh, copy and paste this from our presentation that we did earlier, which is defining the model. Okay, how are we defining it? Again, remember the sequential that we just imported? Sequential makes it easy to add layers. You can add these layers many ways. One is you can actually say, okay, my input equals to this, and then comes my layer one equals to something, applied on input, layer two equals to, again, something else applied on my layer one. You can, that's one way of adding, but I like the sequential method because it makes it very easy for us to put these models together. If you have, uh, if you wanna to put together very complicated models with skip connections and all that, this may not be the ideal way, but that's way advanced, way in future, okay, not yet. So let's stick with sequential method. So when you do model equals to sequential, it started that, okay, now I am model. To that model, we are adding a dense layer with 16 units. Remember, we have input layer, dense layer with 16 and output, that's it. So dense layer with 16, my input dimension equals to 30. If this is an image, your input dimension would be two dimension. It would be um, 256 by 256 or something. So that's where you would put your input dimension. And the activation function here is called ReLU. And let's kill this message again. Activation function is a rectified linear unit there. And before going to the next layer, let's drop off 20% of our connections randomly, okay? And then uh, let's add another layer called dense layer with one output and activation equals to sigma. And finally, once we are done with that, let's compile the model using binary cross entropy loss. Again, I explained this earlier, optimizer as Adam and metrics as accuracy, and then let's print out the summary. So when we do this, it should show us, uh, this is a bit on the slow side, but okay. It is going to show us our architecture there. So it's telling us, okay, the first layer there is uh, 16 shape of 16 and we are dropping out and then we have another dense layer with an output of one and this none represents how many ever inputs you have okay so uh, ignore that for now uh, that will make more sense again when we deal with convolutional neural networks activation uh, again one now you see here parameters how many parameters are here 496 
and zero here because this is just dropping out there are no parameters what are parameters again these are again go back to my two lectures ago when we talked about what is deep learning what parameters do we need to train what parameters do we have weights and biases right if you remember a neuron has multiple inputs including weights and biases so how many do we have 496 in fact if you sit down with your uh, pen and look at how many inputs are coming in and uh, uh, you can calculate how many total parameters are in each layer we'll probably go through this exercise just for the fun of it and here you have only one and you see you have 17 parameters how come you have 17 parameters remember what's before this before this you have something that has 16 so 16 weights plus one bias equals to 17 that's why you have 17 here math is easy here it's a bit you can do the math <laughs> right there when you uh, look at this okay so you have these many and it's telling us total parameters are 513 and trainable parameters are 513 that means we have 513 weights and biases that we need to train that's what this is sometimes your total parameters and trainable parameters will be different because some parameters are non-trainable during our uh, back propagation during our uh, during our training so this gives a nice summary of what's going on with our model again this is a very simple one but yet it communicates it, it effectively demonstrates the power of deep learning here we are all set now we just need to run this how do we run this we define a model now we need to fit the model to our x and y okay let's do that so let me copy the next couple of lines and let's open a code window right there this is important normally you don't need history right there you can just do model.fit but i do history equals to model.fit why because when it's training the model it it uh, it generates it generates some output like accuracy right we are keeping track of accuracy right there metrics it keeps track of loss every time it goes through an epoch i would like to capture all of that into a dictionary so that's why I have a history here so this is where all that information is captured so I can do the plotting and everything later on okay this is a good habit right there now I'm doing model.fit fit to what my x and y what is our x x train y is our y train right and when I say verbos equals to sorry for this verbos equals to one that basically means uh, while we are training display the output okay that's what we're boss uh, is if you put zero it just stays blank so you don't see anything but it's training in the back i like to put this as one and epochs equal to 100 okay again i'll talk about what epochs are think of epochs yeah a good definition right now is in in a given epoch the model sees every part of your training data Okay, so if your training data has 450 data points or how many ever, in one single epoch, it sees all of those. And batch size is 64. What does that mean? That means it loads 64 data points at a time and then uh, uh, calculates, you know, uh, fits this, uh, fits these, uh, the model, and then it loads the next 64, next 64, and so on. So each of this is called an iteration and it takes multiple iterations to get to all of our data. Okay, that's all this is. Batch size, uh, if you don't have a lot of RAM when you're dealing with images, work with smaller batch size. I'll do another video on batch size. Stay tuned. I'm introducing all the terminology in this video. That's it. Validation data. Okay, while it's training, it checks something. What does it check? It actually checks accuracy. Accuracy is by definition, you're looking at what we are predicting versus what's actual, right? So it's using these as ground truth, okay? Uh, my Y test here is the ground truth and it actually comes up with some sort of a prediction and it compares these two and says, oh, this is your accuracy after one epoch, after two epochs and so on. Let's, uh, I think I accidentally added a cell, but this is, I hope this, this, this makes sense. So it goes for hundred epochs because we have GPU, uh, this will go like that okay so let's go ahead and start and this is the fun part 
staring at the screens. You see how fast this is? It's actually going through each epoch so fast. Now let's actually go from epoch number one so we understand exactly what's going on, okay? So, oh, sorry. Here is our uh, epoch number one out of 100. It took two seconds initially, and then it's almost zero seconds. Well, it's some milliseconds right there. And uh, the loss here, which is our categorical cross entropy, the value is 0.7. And remember, the goal for machine learning, for deep learning, is to minimize this loss. Okay, so as you go through, you'll see the loss values to be decreasing. It should be decreasing, otherwise it's not going in the right direction. The accuracy should be going up. This accuracy is the accuracy on the training data. So it's actually going up. You see, 38%. Well, it went down and it's like, oh, wrong, wrong direction. Let's go back. And then you see the accuracy should be increasing. Validation loss and validation accuracy, we cannot see validation right there, validation accuracy should also go up almost in a proportional way to your training. That's when you know you have very good training. I'll talk about, I'll talk about uh, whether you're overfitting, whether, you know, all of these in upcoming tutorials. But again, the, the key point here is at the end of this, when we look at our 100th, 100th uh, epoch, you see that our validation accuracy is 97.2% and our training accuracy is 93, which is, which is weird, right? Why would we get better accuracy and validation than training? We'll get to that later on. But hopefully you see how uh, the deep learning is working right here. It's minimizing the loss, checking the accuracy every epoch and printing out what the accuracy is. So you can see that, okay, eventually the validation loss went down to, it started off at 0.7, I mean the training loss, and now it's at 0.2. You can plot this. This is exactly why I like to store my data as history. So let's go ahead and plot it. Let us add another cell, plot it. And again, from history, there is something called history. Go ahead and look at loss and plot it. That's all I'm trying to do. We do that both for uh, training and validation. We'll also plot the accuracy and validation accuracy. You can track multiple metrics. If so, you can plot all of those multiple metrics here. So let's go ahead and plot this and copy and paste this code. I use this code. I copy this into all my uh, uh, you know, uh, files. So here you go. So this is a nice way. It started off with high loss right there for both training and validation. And as the epochs go by, you see how it's getting better and better and better. At some point it saturates, meaning it reached the, the, you know, the best it can actually do. So no matter how, if you keep increasing your epochs, you may make things worse <laughs> sometimes. And here you can see the accuracy. Initially very bad accuracy, but literally after the first 10 epochs, you got like very good accuracy and you're not improving your accuracy anymore after that. So this tells you how good your model is and uh, uh, for this data set, okay? Um, we are almost done. Actually, let's go ahead and do some predictions on the test data set. Remember, I mean, we use the test data set here to, to, to keep track of validation, but if you have lots of data, I recommend uh, splitting your data into three. Training, validation, and testing. Validation is during the training process, you're actually looking at, oh, how good your model is so you can make certain decisions. You can say, yeah, this is not good. Let me go back and tweak the model and all that stuff. Testing data set, uh, in an ideal world, testing data set is something that your model never, ever, ever had to encounter. You never tested anything. This is the new data that's coming in. Let's see how my, my product you know, that we just developed, which is our model, is working on the testing data, okay? Now, finally, let's uh, go ahead and do the predictions and uh, plot it on a confusion matrix, which we have done many times in the past. So what I'm trying to do is I'm calling this y predict. What is my y predict? Model dot predict on x test, right? So we, div we just trained the model we are doing model.predict. This is very similar to random forest. We have done this many times in the past. So if you just do that, then your y predict would be a uh, probability going between zero to one. So here I'm just saying, okay, my y predict is uh, y predict greater than 0 0.5. Anything above 0 0.5 is equal to one. Anything below 0 0.5 equals to zero. So I'm just binarizing this. Otherwise you get a continuous range of probabilities right there, okay? So in fact, let's go ahead and run selection right there. And uh, let's print y test 
so we can just look at a few values oh sorry y test y pred y predict let's uh, run this run the selection you see the values are 0 0.9 0 0.96 0 0.98 i would call these one one and one this would be zero, this would be zero, this would be zero, right? So uh, I'm, I'm just setting a threshold right here in the next step saying, okay, go ahead and anything above 0.5, convert that to one. Okay, so let's uh, run the selection and let's, let's, uh, I'm curious, uh, let's go ahead and paste that right there runtime and uh, where is my rerun selection now you can see the i mean i said one and zero but boolean true or false is also uh, pretty much the same thing right in fact if you just go ahead and look at your y test values if you only look at y test if you predict this uh, i mean it's not predict you print this you should get zero one 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 right now that's exactly why i'm converting these into binary because now i can actually go ahead and uh, uh, and calculate my accuracy and actually print out a confusion matrix so from scikit learn metrics we are using confusion matrix uh, confusion matrix with y test and y predict now that they both are boolean so uh, and now i'm using uh, seaborn heat map to visualize this because this is this is the best way of actually visualizing so let's go ahead and run all of these and here is our heat map amazing accuracy as you can tell right you can also print uh, the accuracy which i think we did did we not print out the accuracy but this is this is uh, uh let's see we haven't printed but uh, we'll do that in uh, upcoming but this is this is a great way of actually visually telling what your accuracy is of 86 that are labeled zero uh, of, I mean, of, uh, I believe, 87 test ones, we got 86 correct, one wrong. Of 54, we got 53 uh, correct and uh, three wrong right there. Or sorry, the other way around. Fif out of 54, we got 53 correct and one wrong. And out of 89, 86 correct and three wrong or something. But either way, you got bulk of your data correctly predicted, only four mis uh, wrongly predicted. This is, this is amazing accuracy, almost 98% of accuracy. In fact, if you go back all the way up here, you can tell what the accuracy is 97.2 percent okay so uh i think we should uh, the video is long anyhow i think we should stop here but uh, hopefully uh, you manage to follow along and then now it's your turn to go ahead and practice this put one thing at a time if you want you can work on this exercise and also find any other data set there is like a uh, another data set that's pretty good uh, i think it's uh uh, it's uh, smokers versus non-smokers uh, heart disease, you know, smokers and bikers, uh, you know, uh, and heart disease data set. That's also a good one. So go ahead and practice these. And uh, uh, what I wish you learned from this entire exercise, you know, uh, is a bunch of keywords that we are going to talk about later on when we get to, uh, you know, in the upcoming lectures. Activation, dropout, dense, uh, you know, what, what are these? What is optimizer? What is loss? So let's spend the next few lectures understanding each and one of these. So in future, when we look at exactly the same code, you'll be looking at this with a completely different perspective. And I went through this, uh, ex uh, this process of enlightenment and I am excited to take you guys through this same journey. So let's go ahead and meet in the next tutorial. I know you absolutely enjoyed this video, so go ahead and uh, like it, subscribe this channel so you get notified whenever the next videos get uh, uploaded. Thank you very much.